So uh, on the same note, let's start this uh, particular session. Um, so how exactly we have structured the entire presentation of the entire slide deck over here is that first of all, we will uh, try to uh, help you guys identifying or giving you the uh, gist that why exactly data is important. When I say data, it means the personal data as well. Now, I guess all of us as of now in the market know that how much personal data is important for all of us or for all of our organizations at the end of the day. It is very, it is very, very important for all of us to protect the personal data, whatever our organizations or whatever we are processing at the end of the day. Going on the same facts, we'll be helping you identify, or let's say we'll be helping you analyze that what is the objective of all these privacy security requirements, which are coming into day-to-day -day of our lives, or let's say day-to-day -day of lives of our organizations, and also encircling so much fines on many of the organizations across the globe. When I say fines, it means penalties. So many penalties are going on across the globe with respect to same. So on the same track, what we have done is that we have taken PDPA because uh, right now uh, we are trying to uh, take a few regulatory or let's say the local governance uh, requirements or guidelines from uh, Philippines, Malaysia and Singapore. And uh, we have taken into perspective the PDPA, uh, the Personal Data Privacy Act over here. Uh, which is of course led by the commission, the, 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 the data protection commission of Singapore. Um, and we have tried to draft the entire workshop around the same PDPS cycle. Um, so just to begin on the same note, over here we are trying to identify that what exactly is the objective of the PDPA. So if you'll see on your slide, or let's say if you'll see on your screens, it clearly says that the PDPA, the sole purpose of the PDPA, or I'll say any of the personal data privacy acts is to prevent the misuse of the personal data, whatever is being stored, processed, or transmitted across any of the organizations. Now, when I'm saying organizations, it doesn't just mean that a third party service provider. It might also mean that you yourself, or let's say your own organization might be processing that particular data. So the PDPA, or I'll say the data privacy of any of the organizations goes around in the same fashion that they are there to protect the, the, let's say the confidentiality of the data, the integrity of the data and the availability of the data at all the times. Now PDPA is something which is typically focused or let's say has come out from the Singapore domain itself. Um, when you are talking from Philippines, um, I guess the that's what we have uh, researched that the Republic Act number 10173 is also known as the Data Privacy Act. And uh, that is where they are talking about the protection of data, whether it's personal or sensitive or private or any other type of data elements. Okay. And that's why they are saying that this particular Data Privacy Act is meant to cover both natural and jurisdictional funds persons involved in the processing of personal data. On the same front, they're also saying that a data protection officer, a DPO, is also required to be appointed in all these cases, wherever you are the data controller or the data processor, any of the cases. And lastly, if you are going to Malaysia, they're also talking about the PDPA, the principal legislation in Malaysia, which is again talking about the processing of personal data in commercial transactions. Now, over here, we have just taken into perspective three of the uh, local governing laws in three of the countries. However, if you'll see right now in the entire market from the West Coast to the East Coast, or let's say from the Western market to the Asian market, each and every state itself, I'll not even say country, but even state itself are coming up with their local laws for privacy. Whether you talk about the California Privacy Act, whether you talk about the New York Privacy Act, which is still, uh, let's say, going to be implemented soon, soon enough, then we're talking about the GDPR. Then we are talking about, uh, let's say, the, uh, the Data Protection Bill, which has come into India. Then we are talking about the PDPA. 
uh, then we're talking about these local regulations and guidelines. So you can see that how much governments or how much local regulations are understanding that how much this personal data, how much this personal information is very crucial for the functioning of the entire organization or let's say for the entire global ecosphere. That is the very reason why recently you might have seen at many of the times, many social networking giants have been fined um, millions and millions of euros and pounds and dollars just because when they were tra transferring particular information or private information to a third party service provider, they never took their due diligence, which we'll be talking at some time as well, that what, what was the fine on them. So you have to understand that why exactly this particular data is important and the in the local regulations the local governing bodies and the local government bodies have already identified this particular uh, let's say data as very crucial very important for all of us so that the protection can start accordingly so going on the same front going from a local regulatory compliance guidelines let's start this workshop so over here we'll be covering first of all the okay, what exactly is the relevance of the data uh, the sensitive data, the pros and the cons, uh, why exactly sensitive data required and uh, what, what exactly are the advantages and the disadvantages and all. Uh, then we'll be talking about that, okay, what can and cannot be stored because there will be a few elements which you can store uh, maybe with or without consent um, and a few elements which you cannot store at all. If you're storing it, then of course you will be violating the local governing uh, regulations, like we are talking about the PDPA, we are talking about uh, a few standards as well. Like let's say we'll be talking about the PCI DSA as well as, as a standard that what all things can be stored and not. Uh, then we'll be telling about the what PCI DSA is telling us. Uh, so we have also taken apart from the PDPA, we have also taken the PCI DSA as a standard that uh, what all information are allowed to be stored as per the PCI DSS standard. Um, and many of you might be knowing that PCI DSA stands for the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. Um, Opposed that, we'll be talking about the recent trends. When the recent trends means we'll be talking about the penalties and the fines which have been imposed on uh, global organizations, uh, where, where we are, we'll be talking about a few data elements from the ICO. Um, post which, we'll be talking about data discovery, that what is it? Uh, where we'll be talking about a glimpse about, uh, uh, let's say, uh, if you are trying to identify a particular data element, if you are trying to identify a particular personal data, then what are the things you should look for? And at last, we'll be going ahead or let's say looking forward for a data discovery tool as well. So let's start on the same agenda. <clears throat> now, data. All of us are aware that each and every day, uh, all around us, the data is just going back and forth. And that is why it has become an unavoidable part of our business today. None of our business, none of our organizations can work, can properly work or properly function without the data being fed inside it. That is the very reason why one particular word blinks us, which is known as big data right now, which is nothing but all of these types of information combined and then trying to take out or trying to churn out information which will help us analyze the user behavioral or let's say the user tenderness or the user tending to buy a particular product or sell a particular product or maybe just going around from the Google Maps and all those things. All these things are, are tracked using the data which is associated with you or me. That's why, for the very same reason, why these local governing bodies that we just identified a few uh, slides back are trying to secure the entire personal data, whatever they have identified. On the same front, if we're talking from payment card data perspective, the card number, the expiration date, the CV2 value, the track one and the track two data are a few data elements which are personal, which are personal to a card holder. Similarly, when we are talking about the PII, the personal identifiable information, uh, we talk about the name, the biometric data, the date of birth, the uh, social security number, the unique ID numbers, etc. And then if we are talking solely from, uh, let's say, from an Asian market perspective, then we're talking about the PDPA. 
where we are talking about the NRIC number, which is the national national registration number, which we have, uh, the passport number, the CCTV images, the name, the age, telephone number, occupation, etc. Now, when we're talking about PDP over here, because the payment card and PI data are uh, very generic uh, information. However, when we're talking specific to a particular country, a particular domain, uh, we are talking about PDP over here. A uh, particular question comes into mind that how exactly you are saying the name, age, telephone number, and occupation will be able to uniquely identify. Now, name itself, or age itself, or uh, maybe occupation itself might not be able to uniquely identify a particular individual. I'm not talking about the tel telephone number, but I'm talking about the name, age, and occupation. And maybe take the address as well. Now, when we combine all these three or four information, that is when I will be able to uniquely identify an individual. And as per the Personal Data Protection Act, which has been coming under the Personal Data Protection Commission, PDPC, uh, they are talking about the same thing, that even if I combine a few data elements, a few, uh, you can say, tags, and able to identify a person uniquely, even then, those particular information, those particular data elements have to be secured as per the PDPA guidance documents, which they have. So, this particular slide, this particular, uh, let's say, presentation, or let's say this particular, uh, uh, you can say, the slide, tells us that with respect to different standards, with respect to different guidelines, with respect to different local governing bodies, what data elements are considered to be private or personal? Why exactly do we require to know this? So that we can protect that particular data accordingly, according to the local governance laws and local governance requirements. Now, if let's say we talk about the PDPA, then they are defining as the personal data that can identify a person directly or indirectly. Like the way we said in the last slide, or said in, 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 in the last uh, deck, that they are talking about the date of birth, the name, all these things combined, I'll be able to uniquely identify a person. Or the NRSA number, or the, na the national registration number, I'll be able to again uniquely identify uh, an individual. Similarly, a telephone number, I'll be able to uniquely identify an individual. So all these data will be considered as a personal data, which will specify or let's say, which will uniquely tag a particular individual. Now, what is the benefit of PDPA? What is the benefit of this Personal Data Protection Act? Is that it protects the consumer rights by supervision of service providers. What do you mean by this? It means that the organizations like yours and mine organization who service processing personal data like this have to comply with the regulations and guidelines why do we need to because if let's say tomorrow i am performing or let's say i'm doing a, a let's say an e-commerce shopping on any of the websites or uh, let's say i've just booked a grab over there um, in any of the countries over there in southeast asia at that time they are taking my personal information now, who, who will ensure that the personal information is stored, processed, and transmitted in a secure fashion? Now, PDPA over there will help us uh, regulate the standards, the requirements, the controls, so that Grab or any other such type of organization would be able to securely store, transmit, and process these kinds of data elements inside the organization. And they store only those data elements which are required to be stored with valid business justification, with proper retention period and security controls and security requirements. Otherwise, they should not store it. That's why PDPA, the Personal Data Protection Act, is so much important. Okay. Now, um, just to uh, we can say highlight one more point over here that we are taking PDPA as a standard. It doesn't mean that the same requirements or the same controls are not applicable for the other regions. It is still applicable for the other regions as well. However, PDPA we have just taken as a normal baseline because that is one of the, you can say, the most relevant, um, you can say, the, the Data Protection uh, Act, which is available across all the three nations which we are targeting over here. So that's why we are uh, strictly focusing on the PDPA. But the same level of control, the same level of definitions are applicable throughout the regions. Now, 
um, a few dates which uh, many of you might be aware of and uh, let's say if you're not then you can take note, note of it that uh, in May 27 2019 uh, the PDPA board um, actually came up across with around 12 laws which were issued within uh, 180 days and uh, enterprises have been given timeline till May 28th, 2020 uh, to implement all the PDPA guidelines and to comply with the PDPA rules and regulations. Now, uh, one particular thing to be kept into mind over here is that PDPA or GDPR or any of these European uh, or let's say California Privacy Act or any of these are not a, uh, I will say, a certification requirement. When I say certification requirement, means that you cannot say that, okay, I'm certified on PDPA or uh, I'm having an attestation of PDPA or I'm having an attestation of GDPR, something like that. That's not possible because these are local regulations, these are local guidelines, these are local laws per se. You cannot certify yourself or let's say any other third party cannot certify you. You can say that, yes, I'm following the relevant guidelines of the same. I can say that, yes, I'm following all the requirements as described in the specification, but we cannot say that, yes, we are certified on the same. Now, based upon the PDPA, now many of you might be uh, noticing that NRIC number is, uh, let's say, a unique number, which is uh, basically used in Singapore for uh, let's say all the uh, unique identity of each and every individual. Now, when exactly, or let's say, when exactly you should give your NRIC number? Whenever, let's say, you are entering into, or let's say, your uh, children are entering into preschools, um, in the healthcare and real estate transactions, and the insurance applications of claim. Okay, that is where actually you need to give your NRIC number. When you're talking about the law from a law perspective, um, whenever you are seeking treatment at a clinic or maybe joining a company or uh, you are going to an ISP internet service provider, or maybe a telecom provider, uh, you're subscribing to any of the services, you are going into a hotel, um, maybe enrolling in a private education institution um, or visiting a massage establishment as well. Uh, yeah, many of you might know, might not know, but yeah, even by while visiting a massage establishment, you need to give your NRIC number in those cases. And when you are not required to give, or something like when you are buying a movie ticket, or when you're taking part in surveys, or renting a bicycle, and all these things. Now, why we are trying to tell you that okay, where exactly you need to give your NRIC number, so that you yourself or we as a consumer we as an uh, let's say an end consumer are also aware about all of these activities or let's say of all of these processing data elements now tomorrow if i go to any of the shops and they ask me for an nrc number at that time this particular thing should click in my head that why exactly do this particular personal require my nrc number because even over here if we'll see as per the law it's not even required so why should I give it to him? Okay, so that is the very reason why awareness or security always begins at home. That is the very reason why we need to protect this particular data, first of all, by self-awareness. We should not even give this data to those particular organizations, to those particular persons, which are not required to even store, process, or transmit it. That's why it's very important that we ourselves or you as an organization uh, provide the awareness to all of your customers that when or when they should not give this particular data to any of the individuals across the uh, industry domain the fine points about the personal data protection act is that the personal data is defined as information which identifies the person directly or indirectly which we have already covered now, uh, many of you might be aware of this particular fact that there is a particular concept of uh, data owner, then the data controller and the data processor. Data owner are something like you or me or let's say an end consumer. And we have the right to access our own personal information anywhere where it is kept with any of the other organizations. We also have the right to request them to delete those personal information if we want to. Apart from the deletion, we can also ask those organizations to stop, to stop processing 
um, let's say uh, those information whenever uh, they are. So when, when I say processing, it means that uh, let's say any of the organization might be using my data for marketing purposes. Any of the organization might be using my data for statistical purposes. Now, first of all, they have to get my consent that yes, they'll be using this particular data for all this purpose, let's say five purposes. And then at the end of the day, if I as an individual, you as a, let's say individual, want to stop the processing of that particular personal data, we have the uh, right to actually stop the processing of the same. So that is the right of a data owner as per the PDPA over here. And in case of personal information violation, uh, the case has to be reported uh, immediately by a data owner. And uh, they have to inform to the committee as well. And accordingly, the appropriate uh, say actions will be taken. Uh, the data controller, on the, on the other hand, uh, will be responsible for securely storing all of your personal data. And um, they, they will also be required to, first of all, take the data owner's consent before they even start storing, processing, or transmitting any of the data elements. The same thing goes for the data processor as well, that they also need to take a consent um, whenever they are storing, processing, transmitting in a secure manner. And uh, lastly, both the data controller and the data processor uh, need to implement secure measures as per the PDPA or let's say as per the Person Data Protection Act at all the times. Now, what exactly we have uh, gone through so far is that first of all, we started with the local governance, the local regulatory guidelines documents that uh, what are local regulations are applicable across uh, Malaysia, Philippines and Singapore. Uh, based upon that, we identify that what will personal data elements have been identified based upon the PCI DSS, based upon the world's domain and the PDPA as well. Uh, why exactly we are doing this? So that we can identify the importance, the relevance of personal data inside the organizations, inside the ecosphere in which we are living in. And then we, and then we identify that uh, particular types of data elements whenever it's been coming under PDPA or whenever it's coming under, let's say, any of the uh, regulatory guidelines, how exactly it has to be uh, processed or uh, stored based upon the different key players inside the market. When I say key players, it means the data processor, the data owner, the data controllers, and all those things. Now, based upon the same facts, now we are talking about the exposure points. When I say exposure points, that all these, you can say the phases, are there inside each and every organization, or let's say when I say each and every organization, they basically mean that uh, whenever our organization is either collecting the data or using the data or storage or disposal of the data or disclosure transfer data, at all these points, the data can be exfiltrated. When I say exfiltrated, it means that these are the exposure points. And these can be used by malicious users to actually exfiltrate the data from your organization. So let's start with the collection. So whenever you are collecting the data, if you're not taking the consent of the particular individual, or you are doing an excessive collection, or you are doing an unsecured collection, or you are misleading the purpose, the business objective, why exactly you are taking it. For example, um, on your website, you say that, okay, you are taking, uh, let's say, taking care of the cookies because uh, you want to track uh, the user behavior of that particular data or that particular data owner, something like that. Um, but at the back end, you are actually selling that data as well to third parties. Now, that is something which will be a misleading purpose which won't be justified as per the consent, what you're taking from the particular data owner, which will be an exposure point. Similarly, when we're talking about the usage, we are talking about illegal access or sale of data, uh, phishing or identity theft, okay, or errors in processing. All these will come under the usage exposure, that if you're using the, let's say the data in this particular way, then, then of course, uh, there's a high chance that, okay, it will be exposed. Similarly, when we talk about the storage of disposal, uh, the lost archives, the loss of the data and all those things will be coming under storage of disposal uh, dis uh, ex exposure. And lastly, whenever you are disclosing or transferring this data 
to let's say particular third party or to uh, any of the different regions even at that time there is a high chance that the data can be exposed to individuals okay that's why they are talking about the cross border border violation as well over here now uh, this particular thing should be kept in the mind by all of us by all of our organizations that whenever we are trying to uh, let's say send out the data of our own country to some other country then there are strict cross border violations or cross border act as well which come under place so so for example if let's say i am in singapore and uh, i am trying to or let's say i am a singapore based organization i am collecting uh, let's say data personal data of all the singapore based region and i am trying to exfiltrate this particular data to philippines or to malaysia or to any of the other countries at that time i have to take care of the pdpa first over there that what will acts what will regulation what will security controls i have to maintain when i am exfiltrating it apart from that first of all i have to make sure that even uh, that am i even allowed to even exfiltrate this particular kind of data or not if i'm not allowed then of course i can not so this particular let's say the entire cycle helps us identify that at which all points the data can be exposed which all points the hackers or let's say the intruders or the malicious exfiltrators will be able to use to compromise the data which is being stored processed or transmitted inside your organization now sensitive data the pros and cons are the pros is of course the unique identification the rapid authentication the global adaptability and the universal acceptance and the cons is uh, that of course the data breaches which i guess uh, you and me put of us that uh, it's uh, very relevant uh, the data breaches the monetary loss and reputational loss as well uh, we will be talking about reputational loss in some time uh, when we we'll be talking about uh, let's say the, the major fines or the major penalties which uh, has been uh, imposed on many of the uh, giants across the globe um just the data what can and cannot be stored um let's talk about the pdpa first so pdpa says that all the personal data whether where, where it's uh, electronic or in, in uh, non electronic format it has to be protected as per the pdpa uh we have to take a consent from the data owner whenever we are trying to store process or transmit their data or using it for any of the purposes however uh, we have tried to identify a few use cases in which the consent might or might not be required like let's say if the data is solely being used for artistic or literary purposes at that time the consent might not be required the same in the same manner um, if let's say we are managing or terminating an employment re relationship even at that time the consent might or might not be required so there are a few exemptions which are there under the pdp uh, you can go ahead and see that before even you start processing the data now when we are talking about the pci ds is the payment card industry data security standard uh, the card number is something which of course my organization can store but i have to store it securely or let's say in encrypted fashion at all the times uh, if i don't need the card number um, to be used let's say in a recurring transaction or maybe in a consecutive transaction all then i can just truncate the card number that is i can just keep the first six and last four digits of the card number or i can hash it or i can tokenize it that that um however i'll be encrypting the card number only if i need to reuse the card number again if i do not need to reuse the card number then i can use the other techniques over there the card holder name the expiration date and the service code are a few of the data elements which are of course uh, you can say allowed to be stored as per the pci dss standard um and has to be protected based upon the access control mechanisms which you will be having inside the organization not with respect to encryption but of course with respect to the access control whereas the pin or the pin block and the cv2 and the full track data all these types of authentication data elements are not allowed to be stored as per the pci dss means uh, actually no one or let's say none of the organizations are allowed to store these things okay um but again coming back to the fact the local law of any of the uh, you can say any of the nations always supersedes the standards so if let's say your uh, local law or let's say your um, i'll say the law of the land says that okay i will re i will be required to store the pin value or to store the pin value at that time that will supersede the standard any of the standards whatever i will be talking about 
However, if there is no such local regulation, or let's say maybe uh, I'll say a, a, a court ruling, then of course you should not store the sensitive authentication data at any point in time inside your organization. So what PCI is telling us, they are saying that all the personal information, uh, the PII, the personal identifiable bill information will come into the car data. Um, it asks us to predict the car data, how exactly, the same way which I said, that uh, if you're trying to store the card number, then you have to encrypt it if you want to reuse it. Otherwise, truncate, tokenize, or hash it if you do not want to reuse it again. Uh, tokenization is something where you can, or let's say you will be able to reuse it, but with respect to token, you won't be able to perform a transaction. You need to go back to the vault in which you are keeping the mapping between the token and the card number. So as to, uh, you can say, identify and uh, you can say make use of the card number over there. So the adherence is that uh, we should not store card data in plain text at any point in time is the card numbers and all should not be stored at all in plain text. Uh, and why is it required? So that we can protect the confidentiality of the data so that unauthorized access on the data is prevented all the times. Um, and lastly, if let's say you do not want to store it, then the, then the real challenge, the real question comes that how exactly uh, you will know that am I, uh, you can see even storing it inside my application logs and all those things. That's why the identification of the data becomes really, really important where you have to identify the data, whichever is lying inside your organization, whichever personal data is lying inside your organization and delete it at a quarterly basis. Now, this is, a, let's say a particular report which we are using, which is trying to tell you that how much data, personal data is available inside the market. Now over here, uh, based upon the stats, which we have starting from 2009 to 2020, uh, we have uh, around from 0.79 zettabyte of data um, in 2020, uh, we have, or let's say we will be having uh, around 35 zettabytes of data. Now, just to uh, give you a glimpse that uh, what exactly is a, a zettabyte or uh, let's compare it with exabytes actually. So 1000 exabytes, 1000 exabytes is one zettabyte. Now, uh, many of you might be thinking that, okay, what exactly are these jargons? So you can just map it from this particular thing that in 2007, there was a study in which the estimated information content of all human knowledge was 295 exabytes. All right. It was 295 exabytes. And right now I'm talking about that one zeta byte is actually 1000 exabytes. And by 2020, we'll be having 35 zeta bytes of data, which is I guess many folds over and above the data, which our human brain was actually able to store, process and transmit at that particular time. Okay, the information content, which was there inside the brain. So with this much of data elements present inside the market, you can understand that why exactly these types of local regulatories, the local governance and all these things are coming up with local regulation. You can say the guidelines and the protection acts so as to secure or protect this particular data. And that's why they are saying that the data protection itself will increase, the, the, the data itself will be increasing by 4,300% okay, in the annual generation by 2020. And the data generated by individuals will be 70% and uh, the data stored by enterprises will be 80% of all the data means the enterprise or the organizations like let's say yours, your and my organizations will be storing out 80% of all the data which is available inside the market, which will be let's say we are talking about a 35 zeta byte scale uh, by 2020. Now, what are the odds of uh, let's say getting struck by a lightning? It's around uh, 1 in 960,000. Um, dating a millionaire, I don't know how many of you might be interested in this, but yeah, that's a, that's a one in 220. Uh, and uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, experiencing a data breach is around one in a four. So you can see the probability over here 
that how much probable or let's say how much uh, we can say easy it is uh, that our data our personal data can get breached or has a high probability of getting breached at the end of the day so on the same front we have just tried to gather a few stats from the uh, we can say from the web or from the from from the world across the last two or three years uh, so the first point over here highlights the penalties and the fines which has been imposed across uh, many of the social giants, many of the airlines, uh, many of the uh, hotel chains, many of the, um, I'll say the internet service providers, okay, across the globe. So we have masked the names of all these uh, individuals, but you can see that uh, um, it started with 500,000 uh, euros in September 2018. Then uh, it was $183 million, um, uh, not dollars, but actually euros. Um, and I believe this was for a major airlines or something like that. Um, that was 99 million, um, again, for one of the uh, biggest giant in the hotel industry, if, if I'm able to understand their name correctly from here. Um, and again, it goes on and on and on and on. And if you'll see, in January 2020 itself, uh, one of the, uh, I'll say the, uh, the telephone provider, the telecom provider was fined with 500,000 euros of fine. Okay, so you can just see the trends inside the market, how much fines, how much penalties. Um, now the GDPR, or let's say the other local regulatory bodies are coming up with because the organizations are not able to protect the personal data which they should protect at the end of the day. Now, uh, we have taken a stat from, uh, from basically the US, the United States uh, in 2018, where it says that uh, the data breaches, whatever has happened, 45.9% actually has happened in businesses, 29.2% uh, in medical or healthcare, 10.9% uh, in banking or the credit financials, and 8% uh, of it has happened in the government and the military. And exactly for these types of data breaches, 20% uh, are caused by attackers or criminals, and 29% uh, are caused by system breaches. Um, and at last, if I am talking about a data breach, uh, we are talking about around uh, more than 14 billion uh, data breaches, which have been uh, lost or stolen since 2013 onwards. Um, and uh, believe us or not, but uh, only 4% of those data breaches uh, were where the data was actually encrypted. So when I'm saying encrypted, why exactly am I emphasizing on the encryption? Because that particular data will be unusable for the intruder, will be unusable for the malicious uh, exfiltrator if they do not have the keys. So only 4% of the particular data was encrypted. So you can see how much of our data, your, your and mine data, is available across the market and has been exfiltrated in these past many years. So when we're talking about the data breach, we are saying that, okay, around $148 is the total, or I'll say the, an average cost uh, per stolen record. It means whenever, uh, let's say a breach happens, $148 is the cost of, uh, let's say one particular, uh, I will say one particular data element or one particular PII data, whatever is being going on. Like let's say, if you have to associate something with Koshik over here, uh, my PII data will cost around $148 at an average, okay? Uh, the total cost of a data breach at an average will be around $3.86 million. And the likelihood of occurring that particular material breach over the next two years will be 27.9%. That is the very reason why you might have seen that uh, a few of the hotel giants a few years back actually suffered a data breach in, in actually a consecutive two or three years range, okay? Means they uh, again and again got hit by a breach. I will not say the same breach or let's say the same threat actors, but different threat actors, but they have been affected, they have been hit by the breaches over the years in these past many years. And if you are able to have an incident response team, uh, which is responsible for the protection of these types of data elements and uh, which can, uh, let's say, implement the appropriate controls in the case of an incident, 
then you will be saving around fourteen dollars per Bitcoin. So if you're looking for protection, then that, that is something which uh, you might have to look at. So data discovery, how exactly it goes is that uh, it goes in two fashion, um, automated and manual. Uh, manual is actually suitable for small and the mid-sized organizations uh, where you might miss critical assets. And uh, automated data discovery is where, uh, let's say you can scan the entire network or let's say you can scan the entire systems which are there on, the, on a network and accordingly get hold of that, okay, what will PI data are available uh, inside those servers, inside those systems, desktops, laptops, and all those things. Uh, data discovery tools, how exactly they'll be able to help. Uh, they'll be able to tell you that uh, which all PI data are stored inside your uh, servers. Um, they'll be able to scan the operating system, the databases, logs, files, extensions. Many times it also scans the images, the video files, the audio files, and all those things. It also truncates and deletes the data as well, according to the business use case. And uh, of course, it helps you in getting the compliance and getting the certifications and getting the attestation at the end of the day. Like uh, PCIDS is one of the standards. Uh, UID is there for, uh, let's say, the India GDPR is there for the European market. Um, HIPAA is there for uh, the US market. Uh, the PDP is there for the Singapore market, and the APP is, is for the Australian market. Okay. Um, Freeware solutions are available in the market, uh, which are of course offered at low cost. Um, but uh, even uh, if you download those uh, free tools, they will always say that, okay, uh, if you're looking for an enterprise version, if you're looking to deploy into enterprise, then please go ahead with the enterprise version of that particular tool and do not install the freeware. Um, and that is the very reason why enterprise solutions are preferable for organizations. Uh, because they have security and support inbuilt inside those solutions itself. Um, so the best tool which uh, will help you in all these activities, the, da the data discovery tool, which will ha best help you, uh, with, with will be which aligns with your business specific goals and security requirements at the end of the day. And before choosing, please remember that uh, all the free tools are neither safe nor reliable. The lack of support and documentation will be, uh, I'll tell you, will be quite challenging for you once you implement it. Uh, and especially when the freeware solutions, when you implement inside your organization, you yourself are not even uh, aware about the code which is there inside those freeware solutions. So it might act as a backdoor as well, which might be able to exfiltrate many of the data. Because uh, if you'll know that whenever i'm having these types of uh, let's say tools deployed inside my uh, inside my organization and if those are not uh, host based solutions if i'm using it for the network for the entire network then i even need to supply my credentials or let's say supply my authentication credentials my ad credentials to that particular uh, let's say tool now if there is a backdoor now even that particular backdoor would be able to exfiltrate these credentials from that particular host to the particular third party and you might not be even aware about it. So those are a few challenges when you're looking at a freeware solution. Um, and it can also leave gaps as well during the scanning because there might be lots and lots of false positives uh, where a particular data might be present on an application server, but the tool might not be able to identify that particular thing. And uh, lastly, data is a powerful resource, uh, secure it very wisely. Um, there we uh, let's say come up with a note that it takes around 20 years to build a reputation and a few years, uh, you can say a few minutes of data breach to ruin it. So choose the right tool to secure your data always. Um, so for the data discovery uh, option, uh, we have a tool which is uh, actually a market leading as Paula said in, in the very starting, which is known as CSA tipper. Um, it comes in both the form that is it, it works on a, let's say an agent or an agent less model. Uh, so it's suitable for most of the organizations and, uh, it's, it's able to scan through the, let's say the logs, the databases, the files, folders, uh, the structured and the unstructured data. Uh, and it's also able to, uh, scan through the images, through the videos, through the, um, let's say the IVR recordings and all those things as well. 
so basically it will be able to help you help your organization understand the uh, let's say the exposure of data which is there so when i'm talking about data i'm talking about card data i'm talking about the pii data which your organization might be storing willingly or unwillingly and uh, as you have seen from the very starting over here so many regulations so many guidelines are coming up every day by day and so many penalties and fines are imposed so it's very important to actually store or let's say to uh, protect these kinds of data elements these kinds of pii data elements however many of the organizations like you and me might not even know that which all data elements am i storing which all pii data elements do i have inside my organization and that is where these types of data discovery tools pitch in and help our organizations in identifying it so that accordingly we can either secure it or just delete that particular uh, we can data element from inside the organization if i do not require it and each and every data element it is something which you have to know that each and every data element should have a retention period based upon uh, maybe the business justification or maybe based upon the local governance regulation guidelines and all those things uh, and as per our r d reports uh, it says that uh, tipper users are able to complete data scan in 70 percent less time because we do understand the that the organizations there's something known as business as usual for all the organizations and uh, you cannot just say that uh, let's say that particular scanning tool is taking ages for for scanning because it will of course lower the processing uh, power of the particular server so that is the way reason why um, our tool uh, the the CSA tipper will be able to perform the scans 70 percent less time now what exactly uh, let's say we have uh, we can say studied over here or uh, the the entire presentation deck was about the different regulations, the different requirements, the different guidelines which are there across the market. Uh, then we try to identify the data elements which are required to be secure. Uh, we try to identify a few of the key points from the PDPA because that is the, one of the most relevant, uh, you can say the Data Protection Act, which we had in hand right now. Uh, on top of that, we also identified a few of the exposure points which might be there inside your organization or let's say which might or might not be there based upon uh, let's say my organization's business uh, but of course that's something which we have to note down uh, that if there's an exfiltration that it might have happened because of any of these four or five domains which we talked about over there um, after that we talked about a few of the protection guidelines uh, after that we talked about a few of the uh, breaches which have happened in, in in the recent past and the fines the penalties which have been endured on top of that we also talked about uh, that how much how much a data or let's say how much a record actually cost if it has been exfiltrated or let's say if it has been uh, you can say taken up by any of the malicious intruder at the end of the day and uh, lastly we talked about uh, the data discovery tools and why exactly we talked about data discovery tools at the very end because we are seeing that we are seeing the trend that these many fines, these many penalties these many data breaches and these many local governance uh, we can say regulations and guidelines are coming every day are imposing fines and are imposing controls on each and every one of our organizations now we will not be able to protect the data if we are not able to even identify the data at the very first hand and that is the very reason why we need to first of all make sure that okay i know i have the asset inventory or let's say i have the data asset inventory for all the data elements for all the pi data elements which i am capturing which i'm storing inside the organization so that accordingly i can protect it or i can delete it if i do not need it so that is why this data discovery tools and all those things become a really really important part of our lives or well, let's say our organization's lives so on that particular note i will end the session uh, now uh, the portal is open for q a you guys can uh, post your questions in the q a section or uh, you can also use the messaging column as well to uh, you can post the uh, questions
so uh, we have one question that uh, does the age come under identifier of an individual or not um, actually the age itself uh, will be uh, let's say an identifier but not a PII data element uh pii can only be constituted if it is constituted with the name uh let's say the date of birth and all those things so it can be combined and then i'll be able to uniquely identify a particular PI, uh, personal however if i am keeping only the age inside my organization then it might not be the pi but if i'm keeping it with the other data elements as well then it will be coming under pi However, just to uh, give you a note over here that as per the PDPA, they are saying that even if in the future you think that, okay, you will be capturing those data elements or you'll be storing those data elements, even then the age will become a PII because at a later point in time, you might be storing the other data elements so that I can uh, uniquely construct a payload and using that payload, I'll be able to uniquely identify an individual. Okay. Uh, how can we take action on discovered data we have one more question over here um so when i'm saying i have to take an action on discovered data it means that either i have to protect it or i have to delete it these are the only two options which i have so when i'm talking about protection of it i need to see if i want to reuse that particular data element again or not if i have to reuse it like let's say the name the date of birth the age or let's say the nrc number or something like that if i have to reuse it it means that I have to protect it with access controls and I have also, uh, or let's say I also need to protect it with the encryption controls as well. When I'm saying encryption, it means that I have to lock it with a key and uh, let's say accordingly protect it so that the people or the individuals who have the key should be able to access the data only and not any other user at all. Okay? That's how we'll be able to, or let's say we should be able to protect the data at the end. I hope we answer those questions. Um, any other question which we have? Do we have any other question? um we have one more question which says for discover tool uh or let's say for discovery tool can we customize the report absolutely you can customize the report as well that's not an issue at all um it includes different parameters that uh what are things you want to include what are things you want to exclude inside the report um so that uh even the report containing the personal data should not be used by the interviewers to just exfiltrate it outside so absolutely you'll be able to the report as well. So that's all we need. Alrighty. Uh, so I guess we do not have any uh, further question. Um, if we have any poll question, then we'll just uh, shoot it over here in some time. We are good to go. Um, Paula, you want to take note of uh, last? So, uh, thanks a lot, team, for uh, joining. Yeah.
Yeah, Bola, please go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. So, uh, on behalf of um, Koshik and um, um, CISA, we'd like to thank everyone who participated uh, in this webinar. And should there be any other web upcoming webinars, we'll make sure to send uh, invites. And for any questions, you can also email me. Um, or um, uh, get in touch with, with any of us uh, at CISA. And uh, thank you again, and we, we wish everyone a, a great day ahead.